stroking. Okay. Buenos días, tengan todos ustedes. Eh, nos da mucho gusto que nos acompañen esta mañana. Eh, yo soy José Antonio de la Peña, miembro del Colegio Nacional, y en esta calidad les doy la bienvenida al colegio eh, para esta actividad. Eh, la, la actividad que tendremos el día de hoy es el primero de dos días. Mañana en el mismo horario estaremos aquí eh, y el motivo son los 200 años después de la descripción de Parkinson, mal plegamiento de proteínas y enfermedades neurodegenerativas. Hace 200 años Parkinson describió, describió el doctor James Parkinson describió la enfermedad que lleva su nombre. Ahora, déjeme comenzar presentando el presidium. A mi derecha tenemos el gusto y el honor de tener al doctor Robert Hoover. Eh, dentro de un momento les haremos conocer más detalles de su biografía. Solo decirles que él es Premio Nobel de Química. Entonces, como tal, bueno, como saben, el Premio Nobel es la máxima distinción en el mundo científico. Eh, la doctora Alicia Ortega. Eh, fue la organizadora principal de este evento. Este, le agradecemos muchísimo todo el trabajo que puso este, en la organización. Ella nos dará a conocer algunos detalles de la biografía del, del doctor Hoover dentro de un momento. Eh, esta ceremonia, esta pequeña ceremonia antes de, de comenzar con la Primera charla del Congreso, que estará a cargo del doctor Hoover. Eh, es también la ceremonia de ingreso del doctor Hoover como miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Eh, el doctor, eh, bueno, eh, dentro de un momento diré más acerca de esto. Eh, Descripciones de la hora llamada enfermedad de Parkinson se encuentran en textos de la India y de China anteriores a los mil años antes de Cristo. Así, en el antiguo tratado médico indio de Ayurveda, la enfermedad se refiere bajo el nombre de Kampavata, donde Kampa significa temblor en sánscrito. Miles de años después, James Parkinson en su Anesei On the Shaking Palsy, en 1817, describe el mal de la siguiente manera. Involuntary tremulous motion with lessened muscular power in parts not in action and even uh, when supported, with a propensity to bend the trunk forward and to pass from a walking to a running pace, the senses and intellects being uninjured. Antes de los estudios médicos de Parkinson fueran bien conocidos, el político y filósofo de lenguaje Wilhelm von Humboldt, hermano mayor del filósofo, geógrafo y explorador Alexander, describe detalladamente los síntomas de la enfermedad que lo aquejaba, es decir, él tenía enfermedad de Parkinson. Habla del temblor del reposo, los problemas al escribir, de una torpeza especial para ejecutar movimientos complejos. Fue el primero en hablar de la micrografía y reparó en la típica postura parkinsoniana. Uf, explica la rigidez como temblor interno, no visible por otros, que provoca una distorsión de la continuidad de mis movimientos. Insistió, sin embargo, que estaba sufriendo no de una enfermedad, sino de un acelerado envejecimiento. La enfermedad de Parkinson es hoy en día la segunda enfermedad neurodegenerativa más común Después del Alzheimer, el diagnóstico sigue siendo, al igual que en 1917, cuando Parkinson describió la enfermedad, una mezcla de habilidad y experiencia clínica del médico. Los pacientes que se diagnostican actualmente con la enfermedad 
habrían sido perfectamente reconocibles por Parkinson y por Jean-Marie Charcot, el padre de la neurología, quien sugirió el nombre de maladí de Parkinson como un nombre más adecuado para la parálisis agitante en 1970. Este momento fija para siempre la contribución de James Parkinson en el estudio de la enfermedad. Eh, como les decía, bueno, el motivo de, de, estos, de este par de días de, de charlas es celebrar este momento, estos 200 años de la descripción de Parkinson. Eh, para ello tenemos la primera plática del doctor, del doctor Huber, eh, que coincide con la plática de ingreso al a la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Eh, los proponentes para el ingreso del doctor eh, Huber a la Academia fueron la doctora Alicia Ortega, el doctor Jaime Más, el doctor Fidel Ramón y yo mismo. Eh, y les recuerdo que la figura de miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias reconoce la trayectoria y obra de investigadores muy distinguidos radicados fuera de México que han contribuido a desarrollar la ciencia en nuestro país. Al día de hoy, la Academia está conformada por 2.708 miembros, de los cuales 2.601 son miembros regulares y 108 son miembros correspondientes, incluyendo ya al doctor Huber, entre los que contamos 12 premios Nobel. Este, uno de ellos es el doctor Huber. Eh, bueno, eh, ¿qué hacemos? ¿Tenemos los datos o digamos el, el, Sí, a lo mejor, ¿no? Este, entonces, enseguida la doctora Ortega eh, nos dará a conocer algunos detalles de la biografía del doctor Huber. Muy buenos días, eh, bienvenidos a esta reunión eh, que coincide con la entrada de, a la academia del profesor Huber, que para mí es un enorme honor eh, presentar, para aquellos que no lo conocen, que creo que son pocos. Eh, eh, déjenme comentarles que al profesor Huber lo conocemos desde hace como 15 años eh, y ha venido a México en siete ocasiones. En estas siete ocasiones eh, ha estado muy cerca de la comunidad, sobre todo con los estudiantes, ha sido motivación para la gente joven que, que, que lo mira y que lo, y que lo escucha. Eh, sobre todo la comunidad científica también este, nos hemos beneficiado enormemente de, de sus pláticas de todo el tiempo, no nada más las pláticas científicas, las pláticas con él en la vida diaria. Es una personalidad generosa eh, y muy interesante conocerlo. Eh, en cuanto a su vida, bueno, es, eh, el profesor Huber nació en Múnich, eh, lindo lugar de Alemania, y tan lindo lugar de Alemania que no salió de, de Múnich, de Bavaria, por muchos años, estudió en, en Bavaria, en Múnich, estudió eh, química, y hizo desde todos sus estudios hasta el doctorado en la Universidad Técnica de Múnich. Y básicamente, después de terminar con sus estudios eh, de posgrado en, en, en Múnich, eh, se incorpora o es cofundador del, del, del grupo de, del Instituto Max Planck de Bioquímica en Martin Street, en, en, en esta misma localidad. El profesor Huber, es muy difícil hacer un resumen, es una vida muy eh, plena de, de actividades, de premios, de reconocimientos. Eh, voy, voy a leerles algunos nada más de ellos. Por supuesto, el premio Nobel es, 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 es una de las distinciones este, más, más importantes, pero está sumada a, a muchas otras más, le ha reconocido el mundo entero su contribución. Eh, entre todos los premios que tiene, voy a hablar sobre sus eh, doctorados honoris causa de varias universidades. Lo tiene dado por la Universidad eh, de eh, Lutria en Eslovenia, es honoris causa eh, de la Universidad de Bergata en Roma, doctor honoris causa de la Universidad de Nova en Lisboa, de la Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, también es doctor honoris causa de la Universidad de Siguan en Pekín, 
Es honoris causa de la Universidad de Nogoya, en Japón, en Japón, de la Universidad de Buenos Aires, en la República de Argentina, de la Universidad de Vilnesis, en Lituania, de la Academia eh, de Bulgarica de Ciencias, de, en Sofía, ¿sí? de la Universidad de Yelanoia, en, en Polonia, y de la Universidad Nacional, en, en Costa Rica. Ha recibido muchísimos premios en todo el mundo, eh, y sus intereses en investigación están básicamente y muy interesantemente centrados en la estructura y función de las proteínas. Eh, él ha estudiado las proteasas y sus inhibidores naturales y sintéticos, las metaloproteasas dependientes de cobre, molibdeno, eh, fierro y, y níquel. Ha estudiado proteínas del sistema inmune, tanto anticuerpos como receptores para los anticuerpos, proteínas de naturaleza, eh, hormonas de proteína, eh, naturaleza proteica, perdón, y sus receptores, proteínas sinasas, eh, también proteínas que están involucradas en la síntesis de aminoácidos, proteínas que tienen como factores eh, algunas este, eh, eh, vitaminas y proteínas importantes en el transporte de electrones. Eh, debemos recordar que el, al, al doctor Huber le dieron el premio Nobel en el año de 1988 por cristalizar la primera proteína de membrana que tiene que ver con el centro reactivo fotosintético. Eh, el doctor Huber no nada más ha estado en la parte de, de la formación, la creación de, de información en el área de la estructura de proteínas, también ha incursionado y ha sido eh, promotor de la innovación tecnológica en el, en el, con el uso de, de estructuras proteicas. Su lista de publicaciones es, es inmensa, tiene más de 1.200 publicaciones, eh, todas ellas eh, con un número importante de citas. Es un científico muy, eh, muy prolífero, ¿no? es muy prolífero y muy reconocido. Eh, en, en el año de 2007, la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México le dio eh, el nombramiento de profesor honorario en la Facultad de Medicina, en la UNAM, y desde entonces nosotros nos sentimos muy orgullosos de tenerlo con nosotros cada vez que vienes. Eh, es, es un amigo de la comunidad, eh, es un amigo eh, eh, de nosotros y, y festejamos que esté con nosotros en la, en la academia y que esté con nosotros en México. Muchas gracias. Bueno. Gracias, Alicia. Eh, entonces, pasamos a la, a la entrega formal de los credenciales que acreditan al doctor Huber como miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Esto se lleva a cabo a nombre del doctor José Luis Morán, presidente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, que desgraciadamente no nos pudo acompañar el día de hoy. Y yo, como expresidente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, soy lo más parecido a un presidente que anda por aquí. Entonces, es para nosotros un honor, en la, para la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, recibir al doctor Huber como miembro correspondiente. Y en nombre del Consejo Directivo de la Academia, es un privilegio para mí hacer la entrega de este diploma y del pistol de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, que lo acompaña. Doctor Juan, muchísimas gracias. Rogamos al público ponerse de pie. Solo estamos listos de escuchar la ponencia inaugural del doctor Huber como miembro correspondiente de la academia, que coincide 
con la ponencia inaugural del Congreso. Well, this is a great, this is a great honor, and there are two reasons for me to thank. The first one is to be invited as speaker of uh, the conference on neurodegenerative uh, disorders, contributing by a lecture which uh, will follow, but more the being elected as uh, honorary as corresponding member of the Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. This is a great honor. Now, I heard about it from the president of the Academia just uh, a few hours before I entered the airplane to fly from Munich uh, to uh, Mexico City. And a few days later, I get the official documents, uh, so being accepted as a, a corresponding men member, well, this is a sign of incredible efficiency <laughs> in Mexico, I admire. Now I have, and uh, Alicia had mentioned that, long-standing uh, connections with Mexican scientists, colleagues, and students. I had uh, a number of Mexican students, and my last doctoral student uh, is actually a Mexican, uh, Marcelino Arseniega, uh, with whom I still collaborate, so one of the reasons for me also to come here was to meet him and to, to discuss our last uh, joint uh, collaboration. So I'm proud, I'm happy to be, what should I say, half Mexican now. <laughs> uh, without uh, leaving my Bavarian uh, citizenship, uh, I had no time to prepare uh, an official speech, but if I would have time, I would have tried to make a relation between Bavaria and Mexico. There are some relations. For instance, the love of the country uh, that I see uh, with my Mexican colleagues. They love their country, and uh, Bavarians do that too. Uh, there are differences, of course. Uh, when I left Munich, uh, there was uh, zero degrees centigrade. It was cold. And I arrived in, in, in sunny Mexico City with 25 degrees centigrade. That is very pleasant. Uh, clean air, clean sky, blue sky, that we also have in, uh, in, in Bavaria. There are mountains which are uh, of uh, uh, different geological origin in Bavaria. Uh, and here we have the volcanoes. They are a bit higher. The highest Bavarian mountain is just 3,000 meters, while the Popo uh, is uh, 5,500 meters, a wonderful mountain. Uh, I once tried with Alicia to climb it, but we only made it halfway. It was, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether there will be time for me uh, to finish this uh, excursion. But <clears throat> again, thank you. I'm happy and proud. Uh, and uh, I would like to continue with uh, uh, the fruitful academic research collaborations with my colleagues in the country and with some of my students. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, eh, este, ya eh, es tiempo, eh, después de la bienvenida del doctor Huber, a, profesor Huber al, a la academia, eh, de iniciar nuestro programa académico de, de la red, esta de la red PRIENT, que se refiere a proteínas, priones y enfermedades neurodegenerativas. Eh, en esta reunión eh, lo que tratamos de hacer es juntar a los eh, expertos en desde fisicoquímica de proteínas y más experto que todos aquí tenemos al profesor Huber, eh, con investigación relacionada con fisiología celular, eh, bioquímica y muy importantemente también la participación de los médicos clínicos en, en esta reunión. Eh, vamos a empezar entonces con la, la plática del profesor Huber. Que nos va a hablar sobre una nueva visión. La estructura de proteínas y medicina translacional. Well, good morning. Uh, do you understand me in the back? Well, this is a conference on uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, I will have a few examples which uh, to show to you which uh, are directly related uh, to this topic. But I would like to begin with some historical uh, remarks on our uh, progress in the last century to see tiny things which uh, are essential for understanding uh, biology and also neurodegeneration. We have to see the molecules when we want to understand their uh, function. Well, <clears throat> I begin with a person, uh, Max Perutz, who worked in Cambridge, uh, England, and uh, is regarded as the father of protein crystallography. That is the science by which we are able to see biological molecules using X-rays. And uh, the first slide shows the title page of a book edited by his daughter, Uh, as a collection of letters to his family. <clears throat> And what he says here is he wrote to his family, what a time I'm having. And this was when he for the first time saw uh, by X-ray crystallography the uh, detailed structure of a protein. Very exciting. Now, <clears throat> that was in the 1960s. So 50 years later, we have many more reasons to say what a time uh, we are having, because we learned to use the whole electromagnetic spectrum from uh, long uh, radio waves to short gamma rays And uh, we made use of particles, of electrons, to visualize uh, objects, from organisms to cells, to large protein complexes, uh, and uh, to individual protein domains. So we learned to use optical microscopy and increase its resolution far beyond that of a classical uh, optical microscope. We learned to use electrons 
We learn to use X-rays, and this is the focus of what I'm going to tell you. We learn to use radio waves, NMR. Uh, and uh, uh, we not only were able to see the structures of these uh, small objects, but also their dynamic properties. And then this information we then combined with uh, chemical synthesis, uh, chemical biology, uh, and its use in drug discovery. So many of the modern drugs have been developed uh, in this way by uh, analyzing the structure of the drug receptors and improving the drugs. Well, it began uh, uh, this century of vision uh, a little more than 100 years ago by the discovery of a person, a physicist, uh, Max von Laue, working in Munich, who exposed crystals uh, to X-rays. And uh, this fuzzy dif diffraction that you see here is the birth document of uh, X-ray crystallography, that is using X-rays in order to analyze uh, crystals. It's not a nice document, but it meant a revolution. Now, Laue published his finding that he had made in 1912, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in 1912, and uh, he got already two years later the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1914, because uh, this was regarded as a revolutionary uh, discovery. Now, this is Max von Laue showing to Count Bernadotte, who was the founder of the Lindau uh, Nobel Laureate meetings that take place uh, uh, each year in Lindau, which is a small island on the uh, Lake of Constance, uh, I regard as the most beautiful spot in my home country, Bavaria, where Nobel laureates assemble uh, together with about five or 600 students. Uh, and each year I go there uh, and also meet uh, Mexican students. So I just can recommend uh, the young people uh, at uh, doctoral PhD or PhDs or uh, uh, post postdocs to apply. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, event, uh, meeting these old guys there uh, and uh, the young students from all over the world. Now, these are the fathers, the, found, the founders of uh, uh, structural chemistry and structural biology. This is Röntgen, who had discovered the X-rays in, in Würzburg in Bavaria. He worked uh, in 1912 in Munich at the university together with Laue, whom I mentioned. Now, the Laue's discovery was spread very quickly, remarkably quickly. I mean, there was a time when there was no telephone, or uh, not to speak of internet at all, uh, to, 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 to England, where father and son Breck worked in uh, Cambridge, and they immediately grasp the importance of Laue's discovery to determine uh, crystal structures. Very simple ones first, sodium chloride, just uh, uh, sodium, sodium and uh, chlorine, chloride, uh, chlorine atoms there, uh, founded a school in Cambridge where Max Perutz uh, had worked and uh, began uh, uh, the had begun the study of uh, protein crystals and found a way to uh, decipher the complex diffraction patterns. Well, <clears throat> protein crystallography, so the analysis of uh, big biological molecules using uh, crystals and uh, X-rays. 
Now we can count uh, uh, the uh, progress of the field, which began in uh, about 1960, early 1960s, when Perutz and Kendro uh, determined the first uh, protein uh, crystal structures. So it was uh, less than a handful uh, by a few people who worked in that field until about 1990. So for uh, almost 30 years, slow progress because of the technical difficulties uh, that are involved in this kind of uh, uh, research. And then we see the exponential uh, uh, growth. So that has to do with the technical technological advances with the uh, understanding that for biology to understand biology, we need to see the molecules and applications in medicine. Now there is a special field concerning membrane-bound proteins. These are uh, difficult to prepare and people thought that they cannot be made in a homogeneous form and crystallized. Now, <clears throat> that was uh, disproven in a sense by uh, our work, which was published in 1985. So the first membrane protein crystal structure was, uh, 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 was published in 85. And again, a very slow progress for about 10 years or so until uh, uh, today we note then uh, an exponential growth of structurally defined membrane protein crystals. Uh, again, again, obviously we have learned what the community has learned to deal with these difficult uh, uh, projects. Now, the membrane proteins are extremely important because they control many processes in cells. They represent uh, uh, the majority of the drug targets. So this was uh, our first membrane protein crystal structure, that of photosynthetic reaction center, which is the biological photocell. Uh, consisting of four components that you see in different colors and the chlorophyll cofactors. So we and uh, the whole community was quite excited about this, explaining how uh, sunlight is converted into an electric current. Now, <clears throat> slow progress, as I had said, but uh, then uh, uh, Many have uh, uh, been uh, busy then in this field, and in particular, uh, and Nobel Prizes have been given for structure analysis of membrane protein. Uh, Christus, the last one was in 2012 for G protein coupled uh, receptors, which are uh, most important uh, drug. Uh, targets and most important in uh, physiology. Well, <clears throat> my own institute, uh, into which I, which was inaugurated in 1972, and I moved in there, uh, having received the offer of uh, a directorial position, was, as you can see, an institute in the forest. These are the outskirts of Munich. And uh, uh, it was called uh, a very quiet place. Now, Martin's Rue means a quiet place, uh, with, uh, in fact, sheep grazing around this uh, research site. But there were a number of prominent uh, uh, members of uh, the uh, directorial team. Uh, two Nobel laureates, this is Adolf Butenand, this is uh, Theodor Lunen, and uh, the youngster that you can see uh, on the uh, left-hand uh, side. So it was a quiet place, but scientifically quite active. 
Now, this is how the campus uh, looks now in 2014. This was the institute I just showed to you. Now, another Max Planck Institute was added. Uh, uh, quite a number of university institutes have been built there. And in the center of this campus is the Innovation and Founding Center of Biotechnology. This is an incubator for uh, small biotechs. It's ideally located as a, uh, acting as a, like, like, like a spider in, in, in the net of academic research institutions, uh, and in fact, very important for pursuing academic ideas to a stage uh, where uh, uh, pharma industry becomes, becomes interested. I will come to that point then uh, later. <clears throat> well, what was the reason for this exponential growth of protein crystallography? Now, one was, uh, of course, that while when I began in protein crystallography, which was in the late 60s, we only had available natural proteins from organisms, from bacteria, or from insects, or uh, any other uh, natural material. Now we use recombinant proteins. And we have learned to uh, work with very tiny amounts by, and with robots, which can set up the thousands of crystallization trials uh, automatically. The second reason was that instead of having a classical X-ray generator, this is Röntgen's X-ray generator, which you can see uh, in Munich, uh, in the Deutsche Museum. I just would like to mention, if you visit Munich, visit this technical museum, which is actually the, uh, the mother of all technical museums around the world. Now, we do have, of course, modern in-house generators, which uh, look quite different, but uh, are based on the same physical principle of fixed ray generation. Now we use synchrotrons, which uh, are extremely powerful X-ray machines, uh, working with a, using a different uh, uh, principle of X-ray genera generation and uh, uh, speeding up uh, the collection of uh, X-ray data by uh, factors of 1,000 and more. We <clears throat> initially have built uh, the protein models uh, with uh, wires and uh, uh, screws. This was my first protein model, which I uh, had analyzed in, uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Now we use uh, uh, interactive graphics uh, systems by which we can we can uh, work interactively on a graphic system and even let uh, the program do the interpretation of the uh, electron density. Well, this I skip, but uh, just to say that by using synchrotron radiation, uh, which uh, emit a wide spectrum of X-rays from which we then select a very narrow bandwidth, and we can change that. So we can change the uh, X-ray wavelengths with which we do the crystallographic analysis and make use of a, uh, of a well-known phenomenon that there is a change in the uh, absorption and diffraction properties of certain heavy atoms, which may be in a protein like, like iron or copper in this case. And we can make use of that for determining uh, in analyzing the content of a, a protein, and uh, we can make use of it for phase determination. But this is a, a, another thing, and uh, uh, 
would cause too much time to explain. We have used uh, additional information that we, we have from small molecule uh, crystallography. Now this is the electron density map that we initially get out by an X-ray diffraction experiment with a protein crystal. Now you already start to see the polypeptide chain, but you see breaks in it. Now we do know uh, the chemical composition, the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide chain, and we do know precisely from uh, other uh, methods how the geometry of a polypeptide, uh, of, of a peptide is. We can feed in this information, make use of it, and then we get uh, highly resolved, uh, very, uh, uh, very accurate uh, uh, electron densities and uh, models. This I skip. And now I come to uh, a part of my own work which has to do, or which is closer to neurodegeneration, namely uh, the problem of protein uh, degradation. Now this is the life cycle uh, of proteins, so proteins are made in a huge uh, protein machine which is called the ribosome as a polypeptide sequence. Now this is a flexible chain of hundreds or even thousands of amino acids uh, directed by uh, the uh, information on the gene which is uh, transcribed uh, to the messenger uh, and, uh, RNA and uh, then translated in the ribosome. Now this polypeptide chain folds up into a well-defined three-dimensional structure. But that process involves errors and uh, not all of the polypeptides reach uh, the structure of uh, the correctly folded protein and uh, there are mechanisms uh, in nature to recognize non-functional proteins and to remove them. And for that, you need proteases, which cleave uh, the polypeptide chain into um, peptides and amino acids, which are then recycled and uh, uh, reused. Now, <clears throat> protein cleavage is actually a very simple process. If you boil a protein in, in acid or in base, then it is uh, cleaved into the uh, constituent amino acids. A very simple chemical uh, reaction, but uh, of course in nature uh, you need catalysts that do that because uh, uh, it should happen at uh, ambient conditions in temperature and uh, uh, pH and pressure. Therefore, you need catalysts. And these catalysts are called proteases. Uh, and we do have surprisingly many uh, of them in, uh, uh, in higher organisms, about 600 in, uh, in human and mice. Now, why do we have so many? We have so many because uh, proteolytic activity not only is there in order to cleave proteins into the uh, constituent amino acids for reuse, but uh, there is also uh, the process of limited proteolus. That is, that in a given protein, there is only one peptide uh, that is cleaved, making uh, two parts out of the uh, whole protein, which do have different uh, structures and functions, and then uh, make use of these uh, two uh, 
entities for their biological uh, function. So there is a problem with proteolytic activity. Uh, the problem is that it may be uh, uh, dangerous uh, because if the proteases in a cell or outside of a cell attack uh, proteins that are important for function, then that would kill uh, a cell or an organism. So <clears throat> this graph that you see here is about how proteolytic activity is regulated in nature. And the surprising finding that we uh, saw when we started to analyze uh, different proteases is that there are many different ways in order to regulate protease activity. What this uh, cartoon shows is the different ways that we discovered by which protease activity is regulated, and I begin with the simplest one. Uh, so the green object would be the protease. This uh, would mark the active site, that is where substrate, uh, peptid, a peptidic or a protea or, or, or protein substrate binds. Uh, now, in nature, we find uh, inhibitors, which are also proteins, which precisely fit into the active site, make that complex. Of course, then there is no longer any space uh, for uh, a substrate to be bound. So a simple case in the first one we saw in the early 70s, this is the digestive enzyme trypsin, uh, and this is its natural uh, inhibitor. You see, they perfectly fit to each other, and uh, they very tightly fit, so such that uh, substrate cannot enter. And uh, the enzyme then is uh, inactive. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this is called the lock and key mechanism of protein-protein uh, interaction. So the lock would be the protease, and the key, the, the key would be uh, the uh, protease uh, inhibitor. <clears throat> now, we found many of these uh, protease inhibitors when we looked at different, for instance, digestive proteases in higher organisms. And uh, we then also looked at uh, uh, non-digestive or at other kind of proteases, for instance, the papain-like cysteine proteases, which also do have their natural inhibitors, which are called cystatins. We do have the metalloproteases, which do have an active site sink uh, required for their function. They also do have their natural inhibitors. Now, <clears throat> let me just... Uh, highlight and uh, this uh, the the uh, importance of the metalloproteases uh, this is this blue object that we see here there are about 20 or 25 of them with somewhat different specificities and they are involved in physiology and in pathological processes as well so it's quite clear that uh, the metalloproteases are a prominent uh, 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 pharma uh, targets. Now what you see here is that this red inhibitor is larger than its uh, target, the protease, and it has an N-terminus which uh, intrudes the protease and contacts the sink, and of course in that way inactivates uh, the protease. This is how nature works. Now <clears throat> when we try to mimic this we can make a small peptide which also contacts the sink in a way uh, that it binds stronger to the sink using a, 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 a different chemical group. Now in nature, uh, in the natural uh, pr 
protease inhibitor structures, we do have an amino terminus, which is weakly coordinating the zinc, but in these uh, compounds, these uh, uh, synthetic compounds, we use a peptide with a hydroxamic acid, which is a much better uh, coordinator to the zinc. So the way is clear to uh, design and make metalloproteases, uh, me metalloproteinase inhibitors, but the problem is that there is not uh, one metalloproteinase, but uh, 24 or even more of them, which all do have somewhat uh, different specificities, and in order to uh, develop uh, a drug, we require specificity and potency. Uh, so the problem here for drug design and drug development is uh, uh, specificity. Thank you, Alicia. Well, a second way of regulation of protease activity is by making these proteases very specific. And the first of these very specific proteases we analyzed uh, was, uh, we saw, was thrombin. Now, thrombin is the terminal clotting enzyme. So when a, a wound uh, has to be closed, then uh, this happens when there is a, a signal, so a, a wound, then a cascade of enzymatic reactions begins uh, where the upstream component then activates the downstream component and at the end of this cascade is thrombin which then uh, is the final component to make the thrombus which closes uh, the wound. So you can imagine that uh, this is an important drug target, and we began, we became involved in uh, drug design by determining the structure of human thrombin and uh, designing and uh, then making a small uh, inhibitor that you see bound in here. <clears throat> you see that it fits the substrate binding site of thrombin quite well already, but not perfectly. For instance, this six-membered phenylalanine ring does not fill, fill its pocket. So the pocket is larger, and so we suggested to replace it by a naphthyl group, which uh, has uh, a hundredfold higher potency and uh, uh, specificity. So this is an example of how we can use structure information for uh, drug design and development. We also can look at nature solution. Now, <clears throat> these blood-sucking animals, this is the leech, this is a, a, a blood-sucking buck, and this uh, is the tick. They are actually bags full of uh, coagulation factor uh, inhibitors, mostly thrombin inhibitors, because they eat the blood and can digest it only as long as it is fluid. So if it would coagulate, then it uh, would be useless uh, uh, for, for them. So we looked at the thrombin in blue and uh, the leech or uh, tick coagulation factor inhibitors, uh, determining their structure, and then these are then models had been uh, developed into models for uh, design of uh, anticoagulants. Again, shows that structural information can lead to uh, novel uh, drugs. Well, this I skip. Come to another regulation mechanism of protease activity, namely the proenzyme cleavage. So many of the proteases are made as inactive precursors for, for a good reason. If they would be active at the site of uh, uh, synthesis, then they uh, may uh, destroy the cells 
uh, which make them. So they are made as inactive precursors and uh, then they need to be activated at the site uh, where uh, the activity is required. Now, the first of such a example of, of, of the first example of such a mechanism we saw when we looked at carboxypeptidase and procarboxypeptidase. Now, this is a, pepti a, a protease, a peptidase that cleaves the C terminal residues of uh, target proteins. Now, carboxypeptidase itself had been structurally analyzed. Uh, it corresponds to this part of the molecules. Here is a, a zinc, which is uh, the active uh, uh, site metal. Now, the procarboxypeptidase has this additional domain. Uh, and of course, you can, you can immediately see that this blocks access to uh, the active site zinc. So activation is by cleaving specifically at this site here, which is an origin in 95, then this domain falls away and the uh, protease uh, active site becomes accessible. Very simple. Another example is uh, of uh, regulation is co-localization. That is, we do have proteases that are membrane bound, they are membrane anchored. So for instance, all of the clotting factors, I mentioned thrombin and uh, the upstream uh, coagulation factors are anchored to the vessel surface. The, which, which has uh, the important role of limiting uh, coagulation to the vessel surface. And uh, how is that done? Uh, very simple, by having the protease, this is where uh, proteolysis and activity is located, and then linker domains, uh, and then a membrane anchor. Now, we had published this structure uh, a number of years ago, 20 years ago, and then the uh, pharma company Bayer worked on it, and they developed on the basis of uh, the structure of the enzyme part a uh, factor 10A, this is factor 10A, which is closely related to uh, trypsin and thrombin. They had developed this uh, oral direct factor 10A inhibitor, brought it to the market just a few years ago and it has developed into a blockbuster, which is a drug uh, that uh, uh, is sold for uh, more than a, a billion dollar. Again, uh, the structure uh, served as uh, a, uh, for, for the design. Now, cofactor binding. There are examples which we saw where uh, the enzyme requires a cofactor, this blue object in order to be able to bind the substrate. So without this additional anchor that is provided by the cofactor, the substrate is not bound to such it can be, uh, that, that, that it can be processed. The binding there is simply too weak and it needs this additional binding surface. This is one example that we saw. The other example is that the cofactor binds to the enzyme and modulates its three-dimensional structure such that uh, a substrate binding surface is generated. So we saw two examples of that 
uh, during our work again uh, with the clotting enzymes, with thrombin, which uh, may act as a coagulant. This is its natural function, which I showed already, but it also may act as an anticoagulant. Uh, and this requires a cofactor uh, that is called thrombomodulin for good reasons, because it modulates the thrombin function such that it becomes from a coagulant, uh, uh, is converted to an anticoagulant. So again, the structures that we determined uh, showed that. Now this is an old slide in the middle 70s when we looked again at trypsin and its inactive precursor, which is called trypsinogen. We analyzed their structures and we found that trypsinogen is, differs substantially from trypsin by having a part which has no structure. Uh, so, uh, not visible uh, in uh, the uh, crystal structure of the molecule. Now, <clears throat> we also had at that time already the structures of trypsin with its natural inhibitor. And actually, this was the first uh, structure sl slide that I showed to you. Uh, the trypsin inhibitor is uh, an extremely potent ligand to uh, trypsin. And it is so potent that it also can bind to trypsinogen, albeit weaker by uh, seven orders of magnitude, but still strong enough in order to form a well-defined uh, uh, complex. So in, in that way, we set up this scheme of the trypsinogen, trypsin, trypsin inhibitor conversion. And uh, we uh, then thought that in this mechanism, we can convert trypsinogen into a trypsin-like state without uh, having uh, uh, to cleave off the N-terminus, which is actually the uh, natural way to convert trypsinogen into trypsin. So you cleave off this N-terminus, and then the new uh, this N-terminal peptide and then the new N-terminus folds into the molecule and uh, stabilizes uh, this uh, disordered part to form uh, active uh, trypsin. So we said if we have something that does the same uh, that we see in the natural activation by a small molecule uh, then uh, we uh, also convert trypsinogen into, into trypsin. Well, this was uh, an in vitro experiment, and uh, it took us 20 years, actually, uh, to find out that nature actually make, makes use of this uh, mechanism that is in staphylococcolase. These are very dangerous uh, bacteria which when left untreated, cause disseminated coagulation, uh, which leads to death uh, in a short period of time if not uh, treated, as I said, uh, by antibiotica. And the staphylococci uh, work in the following way, though this is inactive prothrombin, and they Staphylococci make uh, a staphylococcolase virulence factor, which is this structure, which embraces its target and sticks its end terminus into a site which is the recipient of uh, the end terminus of uh, prothrombin after cleavage uh, uh, of the pro part and activates it in that way. So uh, by this work, we understood what is happening uh, in this uh, disease uh, condition and staphylococcal uh, infection. <clears throat> now I come to a system of regulation that uh, 
we began to analyze about 15 years ago when we looked at the very big uh, proteases that are inside cells and we found a new regulatory mechanism. Now these are proteases in cells which are latent. That is, they are inactive and they are inactive because the active sites are located inside and uh, the entry into uh, the lumen of this particle is closed. So a novel regulatory mechanism opening and closing entry ports. <clears throat> now the protease I'm, where we first saw that was the so-called proteasome which is a big intercellular uh, protease that is the executioner of the ubiquitin conjugation pathway. Uh, this discovery of the ubiquitin conjugation pathway was honored with the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, it, I think it was 2004. Uh, the three uh, researchers, Chikanova, Hershkon and Rose, they had found that proteins that uh, are short-lived, uh, for instance, signaling proteins uh, in uh, a cell cycle, so they have a, a, an active life of only a few minutes uh, and have to be removed then in order for the cell cycle to progress. And, uh, the signal for removing them is by tagging them with a, a label that is a polyubiquitin chain. Now, ubiquitin is a small protein molecule, and they are covalently attached to the target protein. Now, this is then recognized by this huge uh, intracellular protease which then uh, degrades and removes uh, uh, this targeted protein. Now there is another function uh, of the proteasome, namely it recognizes denatured proteins and uh, uh, cleaves them into peptides which are when they uh, come from, uh, from viruses or bacteria in a virally, a bacterially in, in infected cell. Uh, and uh, they are then transported to the cell surface and trigger uh, the immune response. So the proteasome is essential for uh, the immune response. So it's essential as a waste cleaner, it's essential for uh, uh, removing short-lived signaling molecules. Uh, and it was a great surprise uh, that it is a drug target, and I'll come to that in a minute. Now, the structure studies we did were the following. We, it, 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 it was found that not only higher organisms, eukaryotes, but also uh, higher organisms like humans, mice, do have a proteasome, but there are also some archaebacteria which do have a proteasome. So we started with archaebacterial proteasome for the simple reason that it is chemically simple. It just has two polypeptide chains, which are called alpha and beta, and uh, 14 copies of each arranged in the cylindrical molecule. Now, <clears throat> uh, so we started with that and found uh, the basic enzymatic mechanism uh, of this protein. And then, of course, we moved on to yeast and uh, to uh, mammalian proteasome. We found that they do have the same architecture. It's a wonderful example of evolution when from archaebacteria to higher organisms, uh, the molecular shape is preserved, the, mole the, the basic architecture 
is preserved. But now in higher organisms, we do, instead of having identical alphas, we have seven different alphas and seven different betas. So this generates uh, uh, regulatory uh, properties that the simple proteasomes in, in archaea do, do not have. And of course, these were the interesting uh, molecules for uh, design. Well, I skip that and come to uh, the, the proteasome as a target uh, and a new strategy, offering a new strategy for cancer therapy. Uh, the discovery that a small American biotech company has made, unexpected, I should say, that, uh, but of course based on the uh, structures that we had published, is that these small boronates, which do have a boronic acid uh, active site uh, residue in a small peptide group, uh, offer a new strategy against uh, blood cancer, multiple myeloma. Unexpected because of the very central role the proteasome has in cells, which, which I mentioned. But obviously there is a, a very small therapeutic window uh, that can be used and uh, is used uh, uh, act actually for uh, 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 these uh, new cancer therapies. <clears throat> now, we looked at how these boronic acids bind to the active site of the proteasome. We have no time to discuss that. Uh, the commercial success by this American company of this new uh, blood cancer drug then stimulated in intensive searches all around the world for uh, other compounds that also inhibit the proteasome and might be developed into, uh, uh, in, in, into drugs. And many of these have been sent to us to study how they bind to the proteasome. Now these, what, what you see in yellow is just a, a tiny collection of uh, what uh, uh, is uh, known now, namely those that are natural compounds that are found in fungi, that are found in plants and bacteria. Now, uh, we do know how they uh, interact with the proteasome. All of them have been synthesized and variants have been made. So the usual process of uh, drug design and uh, development. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, a discovery and finding that we had uh, made together with a plant biologist in Zurich. Now, these, they have found that this plant pathogen, which kills uh, bean plants, needs a virulence factor, which they isolated and called syringolin. And we found uh, out what it does. What it does, it inhibits the plant proteasome. It binds covalently, actually, uh, to the plant proteasome, as we see with the electron density here, and kills the bean plants. And on uh, this debris, then, uh, the uh, uh, plant pathogen f feeds. Again, this has been synthesized and uh, is being developed further as a possible uh, drug in, uh, in, uh, f for humans. Now, <clears throat> well, I see time runs by. And <clears throat> the uh, fascinating discovery of the proteasome as a drug target, despite being such an essential uh, component in, uh, in, 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 in cells, then uh, led to uh, a large number of clinical tests and, and then the, the, the application in, uh, in, in, in the clinic led to the finding that proteasome inhibition 
although it's a, a, a valuable novel strategy, uh, has shown to uh, uh, substantial neuropathic to toxicity. So uh, people are still searching for perhaps proteasome inhibitors with less toxicity. Now we thought uh, and began some uh, years ago uh, with the development uh, of uh, a new target, namely the immune proteasome. It turns out that immune cells, uh, upon an immune stimulation, uh, upregulate uh, a specific form of the proteasome, which is called immunoproteasome, which is very, very similar to the constitutive proteasome, but it has somewhat different specificities. And so our idea was to uh, focus on this target uh, by structural determination and uh, develop uh, uh, immunoproteasome inhibitors specific for the immunoproteasome and not touching the constitutive proteasome. So the hope was uh, that in order uh, for, for that with these specific ligands we may uh, uh, avoid the neuropathic tox toxicity. Now this is already then work where we contributed by looking at the uh, three-dimensional structures, but it is outside of what uh, an academic group can do. This is where then we approached uh, the so-called lead discovery center of the Max Planck Society, which is a foundation uh, of the Max Planck Society with the aim to help uh, academic ideas for further development and perhaps to the stage that uh, pharma uh, becomes uh, interested in it. And they accepted this and we are working on together with them and uh, actually uh, then uh, have uh, found uh, a large number of immune specific inhibitors found out that uh, in fact one can avoid the neuropathic uh, toxicity and then also already uh, Big Pharma uh, has shown interest and entered uh, the cooperation uh, in a strategic uh, partnership. So again it shows how academic research then leads to uh, new therapeutic uh, strategies. Well, the proteasome not only as a cancer target, but others have found that uh, uh, it is a target for new uh, antibiotics because it turns out that uh, the malaria pathogen plasmodium does have a proteasome and also the mycobacteria the pathogen causing tuberculosis do have a proteasome and one can look, uh, isolate these proteasomes and design uh, specific uh, ligands for plasmodium or for my mycobacteria, uh, specific ligands that for, for which the uh, human proteasome is an anti-target. So this is what we would like to uh, to have, though so there is a lot of interesting work going on with the proteasome still now here as novel antibiotics. This I skip. Uh, this I, this uh, was a, a novel kind of, uh, uh, of protease regulation that we found in a protein family which is called DEC degradation periplasm, uh, first found in bacteria, in the periplasm of bacteria, and then later also found in, in humans. So it's an ubiquitous uh, protein family, which showed a novel kind of regulation. So these have a protease domain, which is inactive. It has uh, a domain associated with it, 
that is called the PDC domain, which is uh, a peptide binding uh, domain. And uh, it was found out that the protease becomes active only if uh, a ligand binds to the PDC domain uh, in such a way that allosterically uh, the substrate binding site becomes structurally, is structurally changed into a form that is able uh, to uh, uh, develop proteolytic activity. At the same time, uh, it leads to the formation of oligomers uh, encaging, enclosing uh, the, the substrate. This was a, a fantastic work where we saw that by ligand binding, uh, this inactive structure then is by uh, substrate binding converted into oligomers now here are 12 mer and here are 24 mer. Uh, this can be crystallized and this has been looked at by electron microscopy. And it's only these higher oligomers which are, uh, which are active. So a noble kind of uh, uh, substrate induced regulation that we saw here. Now a, a few minutes of uh, my experience uh, with the foundation of business. So I thought that we have in our academic work since uh, 1970 accumulated so much expertise that we should make use of it and offer uh, structure determination and drug design to, uh, to uh, pharma companies. So we founded uh, in 1999 uh, a company, just, just a few people, three or four, which were first uh, located in this uh, innovation center that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, the initial stages of the uh, campus in Martin Street. Now they have grown uh, to uh, a medium-sized company of uh, 70 FTEs. They have their own uh, laboratory building in the Munich area and they offer uh, enabling technologies and uh, lead discovery to big uh, pharma. This I skip again. And these are their customers. So you find the names of almost all the big pharmas there. So they obviously, big pharma obviously outsources this kind of, uh, uh, of work that is structure determination of, uh, of target proteins and uh, then the structure analysis of the lead compounds and the ligands they have, they have discovered. So they come to Proteros and what they get back, of course for a, a fee, uh, the information on how their target looks like and how their ligands bind for further uh, development. Now the other uh, experience I had uh, a few years later uh, and uh, by founding a company that uh, uh, develops FC receptors of therapeutic proteins in autoimmune diseases. So that company uh, had a name, uh, Supremol, and the first slide I show that it made investors very happy, lawyers and Bruker also, and the founders somewhat less but also, so let me briefly go through that story. It began a long time ago, 40 years ago actually, uh, when we published the first structure of an antibody molecule. These are huge molecules in our blood that help to protect us against uh, uh, foreign uh, invaders, uh, bacteria. Now these foreign uh, materials, either whole bacteria or viruses or, uh, or molecules, are recognized by specific binding to the tips of these arms. 
Now, <clears throat> when antigen, as it is called, is bound to these arms, then this triggers the immune response. It triggers the binding of uh, the stem part to uh, receptors. So this is then causing the cellular uh, immune response. Again, this cartoon shows what happens. So there is a, a, a virus, uh, an invading virus, so opsonized with specific antibodies. And this huge aggregate then binds to uh, receptors on immune cells and triggers the uh, immune response. So we did what uh, uh, we are supposed to do, namely looking at the structures. This is the receptor, and this is the stem part. It turns out that the stem part is sufficient for triggering the uh, immune response. So we looked at the structure of the stem part itself, the structure of the receptor, and uh, uh, the complex. So now we thought this is, was uh, uh, in, uh, published in top, top journal. So what can we do? Can we uh, think about an application? So if, because if we were able to interfere with the binding of uh, an anti gene antibody complex to the FC receptor, we, we would uh, uh, stop or modulate uh, the immune response. And this is, for instance, what one would like to have uh, in uh, an autoimmune uh, condition where a body uh, develops antibodies against its own uh, constituents. Uh, so this is, uh, for instance, the case in multiple sclerosis. It's the case uh, in diabetes uh, and many other autoimmune uh, uh, diseases. So what can we do? Now we thought we work with the, with the receptor as an antagonist, so a soluble uh, receptor. This then would bind to the antigen antibody complex, which then, of course, could no longer bind to the cellular FC receptor and therefore stop uh, the uh, immune response. We had some other ideas, uh, namely developing specific antibodies against the FC receptors. Uh, this is one example. Uh, and we found out that an antibody binding at a site of the FC receptor, uh, but not interfering with the binding of the FC part itself, also uh, stops the uh, immune response. Now we did, uh, that was then in the, uh, uh, we, 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 in, in uh, well, 2000 or so, uh, 2010 or so, we did some animal experiments in, in collaboration uh, with other academic groups for prominent autoimmune diseases which are rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, or uh, lupus. And at this stage, then, uh, we uh, found uh, substantial interest by uh, investors, in groups of investors who then uh, invested into a Supremol company such that it continued uh, to work and to develop and uh, then uh, in 2015, a big uh, American company, Baxter, became interested and uh, bought Supremol for a substantial amount of money. Now, the founders were happy, not because of the money, because there was little left after uh, five or so uh, 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 investment rounds but because uh, Baxter promised uh, to uh, 
uh, operate, to continue with the operation of Supremol in its uh, uh, premises in, in Munich and to keep the group together. So we were quite happy. The problem now, a year later in 2016, is that Baxter was bought by a still bigger pharma company and they re-evaluated uh, Supremol, uh, were only partly happy with it, transferred it to Vienna, away from Munich, uh, and so the group uh, fell uh, apart. But this is a not unusual story in, uh, in pharma uh, business. Now, I come to the end and uh, would like to show you Munich. This is the university, the old university of Munich. This is where uh, 100 years ago, Laue worked and Röntgen. Röntgen was professor of experimental physics. Laue uh, was associated with uh, Sommerfeld and the professor of theoretical physics. And this is where crystallography, X-ray crystallography began, uh, structural chemistry began, protein structural biology began uh, 100 uh, years ago. This is I would like to end and thank you. Yes, huh? if you be happy. Uh, si tienen preguntas, de, tenemos tiempo como para una o dos. Estamos un poquito justos de tiempo. Uh, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, you talk about these metalloproteinases that are zinc dependent, and you illustrated nicely the different ways in which these can be regulated. I was wondering. Uh, can you regulate them through metal homeostasis? Like, are there controls or checks and locks in zinc homeostasis that will also control zinc-dependent metalloproteinases? Well, the, I, I think I mentioned uh, the problem with uh, ligand and inhibitor development uh, of uh, metalloproteinases is that uh, there are more than 20 different metalloproteinases with different physiological roles and also different roles in, 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 in pathophysiology. And of course, one would like to address the sp specific metalloproteinases. Now, with the simple inhibitors which have a small peptide and a hydroxamic acid as a ligand to, to the zinc, uh, uh, you do not get any specificity. These kind of ligands bind to all of the MMPs. So the work now that is done, and it's still quite actively pursued in, uh, uh, in, uh, in pharma research, is to find uh, specific inhibitors. There is some, some success as far as I can see from literature. I'm no longer involved in that work. So there are some chances uh, to do that, but, but it's, 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 quite, it's quite tricky because uh, 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 all of these MMPs look alike. And, uh, Hello. Ah, here I am. That was very beautiful. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what you think the prospects are for dealing with dynamics. You have the structure to start with, and then there's a change when many things bind. And what you think is most promising. You looked at Alistairi, yes. for example. Yes. Uh, these are, of course, particularly fascinating uh, and, uh, and there are a, a number of examples in uh, pharma uh, research where allosteric inhibition uh, has been found. Now the uh, 
particular excitement of this allosteric inhibition is that this is usually very specific. So, uh, and uh, while the active site directed ligands usually, as I have explained with the uh, metalloproteinases, uh, target the, the whole family. So allosteric inhibition offers uh, a great chance to, to, to uh, specificity. So I guess... There are examples. Uh, yes, uh, yes. I was thinking, though, you have the structure to start with, and so the yes. allosteric, you know, you could try well, to model, and it's really hard, I know, so I wonder... No, no, no it's, it's very hard. Actually, I would say it's impossible. <laughs> now, what you can do by... Uh, by the usual design uh, procedures to develop active site directed ligands. You have the active site, uh, you can model, you often also have a lead compound uh, already available. So here are on, you are on safe ground with modeling. But uh, ab initio, discovery of an allosteric ligand, I think, is impossible. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to test, you have to screen, I mean, thousands of compounds, and if you're lucky, then you may find an allosteric uh, ligand. But no way for rational structure-based design. Thank you, Professor Huber. Uh, in relationship to one of your uh, latest technologies, when uh, you inject the, um, the receptor to block the antibody, isn't it possible to get autoimmunity against the receptor and get these secondary effects in the patient, for example, or the experimental animal? Well, this is a, a, a human FC receptor, which we inject, which acts as an antagonist. Uh, because it, 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 it binds to the, uh, to the, to the uh, antibody anti, antigen complex in the same way that the cellular receptor does. So, so it, 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 the patient it, doesn't, uh, doesn't generate uh, no, 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 not. We, it's it's, 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 it's human, human sequence, human protein. Thank you. No. Eh, bueno, yo creo que agradecemos al profesor Huber su, eh, su plática, ha sido realmente muy eh, interesante. Y vamos a movernos al, al siguiente ponente. Thank you very much. Justos de tiempo, sí, es, y tenemos que movernos en el programa porque la, la comida está. ¿Cinco minutos? Bueno, nos, eh, vamos a, 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 a tomar un cafecito, cinco minutos para hacer unos cambios, así es que tenemos cinco minutos, por favor, eh, regresemos a tiempo.